Welcome to Libertarian Counterpoint. We're coming to you live from the studios of Access Sacramento in high definition. And now, Libertarian Counterpoint, here is your host, James Just. Thank you, Gail. And with me today is our executive producer, Lee Welter, and activist extraordinaire, Mike Giles. Okay. So, as Lee, you're kind of our resident um, doctor or person here. We can. <laughs> Newsom declared a state of emergency over the coronavirus, specifically over a, it was over a, uh, Oh, a cruise ship docked, I think, docked in Southern California, and it kind of spurred this whole creating a state of emergency on, on this coronavirus. What's your opinion on this fear that everybody has about coronavirus these days? Well, fear is a good human protective mechanism. However, uh, for healthy people, the coronavirus is probably no worse than bad cold, according to some healthy people who have had it. On the other hand, there are some people with diabetes, kidney failure, hypertension, coronary artery disease, chronic pulmonary disease, and they're sort of hanging on to the edge to begin with, and you hit them with something like that and to tip them over the edge. It can be severely dangerous. Hey, my back, you know, someone who's kind of more of an average person, what's kind of your view on, the, on this coronavirus issue? Well, um, basically, I, I know that the flu kills one heck of a lot more people, mm. but the flu is more pervasive. So, and I think per 10 people or something like that, the how is it called, coronavirus? Coronavirus. Uh, coronavirus yeah. is more dangerous, um, a little bit higher death rate than the flu. But... The media is making such a screaming fit out of the whole thing that it, it seems to be um, just looking at next door and different things like that. People are kind of real tired of it, you know. But there's a, an upside to it. People are, I hope, becoming more meticulous about hand washing yep. and wiping uh, the, the, the door handles and mm -hmm. using hand sanitizer before they touch any food. I think that's a good thing. Yeah, they were even talking about making your own hand sanitizer uh, hand sanitizer and how to you know different different concoctions uh, to protect your hands and to kill the germs and stuff like that i mean people are pretty got some pretty good ideas out there yeah, well and for me as an ex janitor you know i spent I spent a number of years being a janitor and so it's an important function and so i'm going as a janitors and the other cleaning staff you know even bartenders and waitresses who clean tables oh, sure. they're on the front lines of this not only are they the ones Definitely. touching these these cabinets but they're also the ones who can make sure that these things get cleaned well mm -hmm. and so you know so i ask our janitors and cleaning staff to be extra diligent not just for your own safety but for the safety of the community as well you know they have an opportunity to kind of help out mm -hmm. not just themselves but the population in general and it's long overdue for passenger airliners to have ultraviolet treatment uh, lights in the air handling system. So we're not rebreathing whatever somebody's coughed into it a uh, half hour ago at the other end of the plane. Oh, I see. So the ultraviolet kills the... It kills fungi, fungi oh. and microorganisms. I think it's a good thing to do. Because I remember reading the words of a pilot, and he said that he has to bring all kinds of stuff on the plane with him because as they're flying up front, they're breathing the same air everybody else is. Yeah. And they're getting all the coughed up air that's from, from the passengers, and they just have to keep taking medicines just, just to keep healthy. Yes, and, and among other things, the humidity is very low on board an aircraft. Oh. Uh, more arid than the, the Sahara Desert. Oh, Something I like I about 15% relative humidity or less. Not a good thing. So the, the ultraviolet would help all that? Well, it would help kill the microbes, yes. Yeah, well, and yeah. maybe we should actually have these, ask these airlines to make a better pass at cleaning the seats and the trays and, and the door and the, the door jams, the That's things true. that people normally touch. I agree. Yeah, the, just touching the seat, you know. Yeah, you, you just, know. you know, there's plastic on the seats. You can't really do much to clean the, 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 the cloth parts of the seat all that often, but you can wipe down those, those seats. I'm an ex janitor. You can wipe down the seats in a plane for 20 minutes. One person can do it. It's, it's not a fun job, but you can do it. 
And mm -hmm. so, you know, you take a quick little wipe, those alcohol wipe cloth and you can wipe them down. And it's gonna create some extra expense and some extra time, but we're locking down half of the world seemingly anyway, so. <laughs> yeah, some some of the people on next door were. I mean, they were joking. They didn't mean it seriously, but you know, you could pour a little vodka out sometimes. You know, wash your hands with that. Uh, well, it if, kills the germs. If it's what you've got, it's what you've got, right? Yeah. Sanitize. It, it's that's the whole thing. It's you know, if you do our basic sanitation, you wash your hands. I told janitors to wear a mask, not so much to keep the the from breathing stuff in, just to keep you from touching your face. Oh yeah, okay. Because you know, it's not so so much from the breathing; it's just to keep it from touching your face. Mm. You could try a drop or two of this. It says thieves. It's from a company called Living Young. Thieves wa waterless hand sanitizer, and you can. You can Here we can do, do it right there on the thing. Here on we drop. Oh. It smells really smells good. Go ahead. Oh, you, can you can sniff it if you want. Well, no alcohol. It, it did smell nice. Yeah. <laughs> I got one See? thick drop, a nice thick drop. And Thank you can you. actually Thank smell you. better it's for, thanks to coronavirus. You know what it's all? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's, hey, you know what? We can all smell a little bit better. Well, speaking of smelling, um, Mayor Steinberg was reelected to, as to mayor, <laughs> uh, but without any real competition. And this is actually something that has been disturbing me across the political spectrum <laughs> is how little competition so many of our elected officials are actually having. Um, how many people are running unopposed or essentially running unopposed? Or how much bias there is. Uh, for example, I first arrived in Sacramento in 1979, and after a few weeks, I wondered, this is puzzling, what's going on? The local newspaper would have a story, and there would be a story on page two that had nothing to do with city government or state government or whatever. There's a picture of Daryl Steinberg. Why? What's the connection here? Well, the connection is they're cheerleaders for Daryl Steinberg. Mm. He's part of the democratic machinery. Yeah, I mean, uh, his name's been bouncing around for decades um, around here. I mean, I, I came as a high school student even earlier than you did. Uh -huh. um, but Sacramento seems to have this history of corruption built into the city government. Um, I think Ann Rudin came, you know, before Steinberg. Uh, mm -hmm. A yeah. couple of <laughs> elections. Yeah, there was Ann, you had Ann Rudin, then you had uh, Phil Cerna, right? Was it Joe Cerna? Or was it Phil? Cerna? God, I can't remember. There's so many yeah. Cernas now. Yeah. And so there's kind of like this family dynasty in Sacramento's that that kind of get created, or the political dynasties, even if they're not necessarily family dynasties. And the uh, government labor unions have a big influence. Oh, huge. Yes. And um, I remember I didn't hear the details because she wasn't telling the details, but she was speaking to somebody close by and she didn't care if I overheard. Um, Supervisor Sue Frost was being interviewed by the Bee um, editors and she was exceptionally, and I'll repeat, exceptionally, and I'll say it again, exceptionally rudely treated and very, very badly treated and spoken badly of to her face. Trying to get a reaction to make her look bad. Uh, that's sort of the regular game, isn't it? Sad. Uh, pr probably so. Um, well, there's the reasons the bee's going bankrupt. Yeah. The well, whole... actually, the reason I read, understandable, is that they want to divest themselves of their pension obligations. That's right. Yeah. The buyer for, I mean, it's, it's not just the bee, it's the whole McClatchy Corporation and all the newspapers. But uh, it turns out, I read this article a, bit, a little while ago, the Sacramento Bee um, now is worth, I mean, the whole McClatchy Corporation used to be worth this huge amount of money. Now it's worth what the Bee was worth a few years ago. Uh, uh, the business is drying up. It, it's drying up hugely. Yes, and our newspaper used to be sort of like the cylinder like this. It's now... <laughs> yeah. In fact, I saw a newspaper, a bee, that was published in 2017, and it was this thick, big, thick, and I had saved it somehow or other. Now the same paper is more like the Carmichael Times or something like that. I mean, yes. it's real tiny. And they want to go digital. It's very cost-effective. My wife doesn't like the idea. She likes hard copy. 
paper and ink. Yeah, you can't you can't change it or lie, because with a digital thing, you, you can, can just change it, <laughs> and then tell everybody that. Yeah, you can just you change the thing, and, and yeah, except for the wayback machines and stuff. How how they can say, yeah. well, you change it on this date, but who's who? How many people want to go back and check and go look and all that, and check on these things. Check yeah. how you know did our did our paper change their story yesterday or did they or was it the same as it was? Well, mm-hmm. Joseph Stolen used to every summertime. I think they did it. They would the people that they had killed, who were part of the government. They went out and took their pictures out of the newspapers and out of the books. Yeah, the, uh, so they uh, didn't exist. Yeah, uh, yeah. they had uh-huh. not existed. They would literally exactly. er- erase them out of the a uh, lot of official records. They go and remove all their official records. All the type. They take the they take them out of even pictures. Yeah, pictures. Them out of the pictures. They erase them out of the pictures. That's one of the reasons that I get upset when people say, "Get rid of that Confederate flag, Confederate statues. It never happened. It never existed. Pretend." That's wrong. Yeah, well, no. History is part of the truth. Yeah, and if you, well, and that's you know, individually, you don't necessarily mind if they want to get you know, any individual community can want to take a statue out or take or not have a flag up. I can understand that, but as a as a concept as a whole, we have to be careful not to erase too much history, so we don't actually know actually what questions to ask in the future. Because if we don't have any of these monuments, we don't have anything. No one in the future is going, hey, why are we actually having this? Well, and then there's the, no question. Yeah, to ask. I mean, one of the things that people. Um, of my former party, I'll say this, um, <laughs> do not want to comprehend is that they keep saying racism, and, you know, Islamophobia, blah, 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 well, all that's that. That's what I said. If you're one of their political opponents, you're racist, 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 yeah. yes. But it was the, the Civil War, the American Civil War, which, like the English did it easy. The government just bought all the slaves from the land, people who had them, and the taxpayers paid, and then they were free. But we had a civil war, and we, our nation, stopped slavery in the civilized part of the world because we had a civil war, and then that symbolized, you know, the Canadians and the Australians and different people and other, you know, European countries to quit being part of slavery. But slavery started. It was already going big time 1,400 years ago when the Muslims came roaring out of Saudi Arabia and went right into Central Africa, and they ran into all these uh, chieftains who had been buying and selling slaves for centuries before, and so they just adopted that, and they bought and sold slaves too, and then finally a Portuguese ship came down about 700 years later, and then finally British ships and French ships and German ships, and then finally an American ship came, and uh, so we were slow on the start with slavery, and we were the one that stopped it. Well, yes, in a way, but... uh, I mean, in the civilized world, we stopped it. It's still uh, going in the Middle East. According to one account, New York City was the hub of the slave trade for the sailing, and some of those ships they would not fly the American flag. They would fly some other country's <coughs> flag so as to not incriminate. In fact, yeah, according yeah. to the same account, uh, yeah. the New York City uh, government debated whether they should stay with the Yankees or go with the rebels because they had divided yeah, there, was, uh, there was There was a allegiance. big division. Yeah the, yeah, the Civil War was an interesting time. And well, the sad thing is, is slavery has existed with human nature since as far back as we can actually trace it. Well, it, it still exists. Yes, yes, in the middle of Africa, and it's, it's, it's a, still happening. It's and a terrible, it's a terrible thing, and we, and you know we have to actually talk about it if we're going to get past it, and if we refuse to talk about it, if we hide the history and we don't talk about the history, and then we can't go forward. And yeah. that's that's the thing about me when we when we lose these things. It's not that we. It's not that I care about a monument or or a flag. It's that I care about history. If we lose mm-hmm. history, then we lose the culture, we lose the context of that, how far we have come. And it's actually a disservice to those people who have suffered that we've lost this, that we're losing history. And one of the history experts said, what we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the other big problem. Um, I mean, I have, uh, I'll never forget, um, my dad spent the last few years of his life under the um, caring care of uh, this Ukrainian family who was licensed for six people in their home. And, uh, and I'll never forget one day 
uh, they were both talking, and um, they 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 spoke Russian and Ukrainian as well as English. And uh, one day, all of a sudden, something happened. They got kind of uh, upset, and they both left the room in opposite directions. Huh. And then after about five or ten minutes, she, Oksana, she came back in and she apologized. And she said that what happened was something reminded them of the horrors of when they were young living in the Ukraine under the uh, Soviet Union's gunmen and how they took teenage girls away and raped them for years and then let them back or or just horrible, horrible things, starving Christians to death and things well, like that. Well, there are slave states still. All the communist countries, look at uh, North Korea, communist China, Cuba. Yeah. And the, the African nations are not very good. There are some rare exceptions, but yeah, uh, there definitely not, are. not enough. But, but uh, she said, we were not mad at you. We're not mad at your dad. We're not mad at each other. It, the memory was just so powerful that we couldn't even speak, so we just left the room and had to go directions. take care. Of yeah. Well, speaking about powerful stuff in history, um, Super Tuesday, Joe Biden, <laughs> oh, oh yeah, just just kind of re, re, was reborn. And talking about not learning from history, the Democrats are going to sit here and and looks like they're going to nominate another establishment hack. And I didn't think they learned the last time. So, so what what do you guys think about Joe Biden kind of re, re, re energizing himself? And well, what comes to mind is uh, what we learned about uh, Burisma, the uh, Ukrainian oil company <coughs> that paid very handsomely to get U.S. government favors in exchange. Mm -hmm. And uh, Joe Biden was very much a part of that. And how can he? How can he show his face after that kind of shameful activity? It just uh, He's got to be shameless, right? Well, I think they're all kind of shameless over a death at Washington, D.C. I think that's kind of the problem. Yeah, well, um, I was just uh, talking a little bit earlier, and I was reminded by a couple of really great guys here that there's this woman called Michelle Malkin, ah, yes. an incredible author, and she wrote a book called The Culture <laughs> of Corruption. And it's a little bit older now. It's been out for about seven years or something like that. Uh, but she describes the massive corruption in Baltimore and the massive corruption in Chicago. And one guy, a guy named Biden, was in the center of the corruption of Baltimore, along with Nancy uh, Pelosi. But uh, the whole Biden family, uncles, sons, nephews, they're all corrupt, corrupt corrupt. Yeah, well, we can go back. We have some other stories here for the other shows about how Biden kind of was a, the lead drug warrior and <laughs> and he's, you know, kind of led the drug war. He was one of the lead drug warriors and then he was also part of the asset forfeiture the asset for, forfeiture seizure program, the Federals. Oh. Well, that's probably a reason why we haven't uh, repealed the the so-called war on drugs. Yeah, well, he says he says not want to repeal the war on drugs. He, he, he does not want. No, to. he does. He thinks no, marijuana legalization is, is is backwards. Well, there's a there's a rationale for that. Uh, according to uh, an excellent book called Chasing the Screen, Scream, by uh, Johan Hari, H I R I, uh, the agency uh, Harry Anslinger was in charge of the enforcement agency for alcohol prohibition. When alcohol prohibition was repealed, Harry Anslinger said, how can I justify my bureaucracy's continuing existence? We've got to find something else. He says, and look at, pardon me, I don't mean this, he said, pardon me, but, but uh, he said, look at those crazy Chinese and the blacks. They smoke that marijuana and they just go crazy and they rape our young girls and do all kinds of wild things. And we can't let this happen. Yeah, the whole reefer madness thing. It was yes. Yeah, it was the anti-immigrants, the Chinese, Mexican immigrants, the the combined with the the racist black, the racist against and people black. people fell for that. Yeah, and then you had the what the we call it the law enforcement industrial complex wanting to protect their jobs, mm -hmm. and so you got this whole kind of convolution things get together convoluted, and next thing you know we have this goofy war on drugs, and that doesn't actually end because even now here in California where they want to do the the ended okay so they stop uh, 
marijuana prohibition, but now they're going to vapors, right? Now they've made vaping illegal. Yep. So they're just, so they, they actually haven't actually stopped the war on drugs, they're just changing it. Uh, yeah. yeah, a little modification here, a little modification there. Yeah, okay, so no longer support, you know, marijuana prohibition. So now we're going to move it to vaping, so now we can take those same resources that we've been using to prohibit marijuana, we're going to use that and we're going to just going to transfer it over here rather than end the whole program. Say. So, I've heard of so many, uh, I mean, I've read various stories and the amounts of money are different amounts, but they're like $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 you get stopped by a cop in the middle of Texas hinterlands or in the middle of Chicago or wherever. It's any amount of cash. And if, if they find cash on you. You've got to asset, be a drug dealer, right? Yeah, asset forfeiture, we'll take that money. You know, $10,000, $12,000, a guy was gonna go buy uh, something for his business or something mm -hmm. with using cash. Bam, they take the money. I and actually read a story just the other day about how TSA or the DA, at some, uh, some truck driver had $75,000 in cash from his business. Not his business, he was just an employee, but he was taking uh -huh. it back to the, and, and they took the cash. Oh. They took the cash and he's just a truck driver transferring cash back to his, you know, I don't know, maybe he sold a truck or something, right? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. And so he was taking cash back to his, back to the, you know, back across the country and they took the cash. And so his, his employers are going, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> You're wow. taking, well, this is all wrong. Well, look at it this way. That's taxation without having to fill out any of the forms, exactly right? Exactly, that's what it is. It's essentially <laughs> been guilty. You're guilty of a crime that we don't even know what it is, but we're going to call you, claim you guilty of it, and we're going to take your money taxation. until you can prove you're innocent. Yeah, instead of uh, them having to prove you guilty, you have to prove you're innocent, which is Well, this has been the IRS all along, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah. That's why, oh, I brought something. There's a, a pro program uh, called the Fair Tax, which will eliminate the income tax and replace it with a retail sales tax on new goods and services. And mm -hmm. uh, I sent a letter to um, my, one of my California senators about this and the response came back that in order to re raise the, in, the uh, adequate revenue, that sales tax would have to be outrageously high. That says something about our taxation and our spending, doesn't it? Yeah, well that money's still coming from the people it's right yes. it, it's they, they, they like to hide in the complexity i simplicity is, is oh, you can't yes. hide in simplicity you can oh, only yes. hide in complexity waste and corruption uh, the income tax system wastes about half a trillion dollars several hundred billions a year on keeping records hiring cpas yep. undergoing audits attorneys, the whole business, it's craziness. Oh, it's, man. So that's the waste. And the corruption is that income tax code is 57,000 pages long. Why? Well, there's a good reason for some of that, because the bureaucrats that write the regulations can then rent themselves up and say, I'm an expert. Do you want me to protect your company from the, the IRS? I'll show you how to do it for yeah. Well, it's fifty thousand dollars an hour. Yeah, yeah well, exactly. Yeah, and it's fifty-seven thousand pages of social engineering is another way I like to look at it. it. It's just By using the name. tax yeah. code to kind if, of if get. If you can't people. get them here, you can get them on page three hundred and fifty-eight. You know, yeah. and oh, maybe two thousand and sixteen, we got something here too. You know, they they can just get you. Only high spot of this comes to mind is um, Democrat um, legislator from Southern California named Holly Mitchell introduced legislation to repeal the asset forfeiture laws. And oh. I don't know exactly where it went, but I give her credit for at least giving it a try. Yeah, I have to give her, yeah, I'm gonna- Holly Mitchell. To, I'll, I'll write that name down. I can't write it now, but I will. And uh, there's, there's tons, you know, you mentioned corruption. Um, I was privileged to attend a two-day presentation by this incredible woman called Chris Ann Hall. Oh yeah, she's JD. a real dynamo. Yeah, she's an attorney. Um, after she was done with uh, being in the Air Force, she became a teacher of Russian language to other military people. I mean, and she's an attorney, and she's a mom <laughs> and, and a wife. And she a pastor of a church? Uh, her, fa her husband is. Oh, her husband is. And uh, they, they can trade back and forth. Uh, but she described, and I'm really embarrassed at this very moment, an American president who was president during part of the World War I, 
Um, Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson, who was so vastly corrupt. He was a lover of the KKK, among other things. But he resegregated the United States military, which had been desegregated aye, previously. Aye, aye. And he resegregated the federal workforce, which had been previously desegregated. And his progressive education thing, he erased gigantic amounts of the history of, of the um, American Revolution of 1776. And George Washington, she named all these names. He thanked every one of the people that she named. Some of them were kid, girls as young as 13, slaves and non-slaves, and whites and Indians, and you know everybody, Brits even, uh, for helping the Revolutionary War warriors. And kids were helping us and bringing in. So, so there's corruption sometimes at the very highest highest, highest place, the presidency of the United States. Well, to often want to go into, we could go and delve in into corruption. forever on this one, uh, but corruption, yeah. 1913 was evil. The Federal Reserve System, which is a way of stealing, it's, it's legalized counterfeiting, okay. is one, and uh, the income tax, 1913, under Woodrow Wilson's watch. Maybe that's why uh, Mark Crane uh, wrote a book titled Puddinhead Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's interesting about the Wilson administration for me was it's actually, you could technically say that he had the first woman president during the Wilson administration because after his stroke, oh, he was yeah. he was unable to, to continue his duties and the, the vice president should have taken over. Yeah. But instead, his wife actually ran the White House. Interesting. <laughs> so that, interesting. for me, that's an interesting thing. So when people talk about we, we haven't had a woman president, I go, well, in a technical sense, this is true. But in a practical sense, we did for the end of the Wilson administration. We had a we had a woman's we had a woman as president who wow. effectively acted as president. You know, she would go into the she would go into the back room and say, okay, well, he said this. Well, no, he didn't. He couldn't. He could. He yeah, couldn't. He could barely talk. He <laughs> couldn't talk. He couldn't comprehend. He had had a stroke. But, you know, everybody kind of went along with it because, you know, during a war and that kind of thing, you don't yeah. want to. But, yeah, you know, we have a system in place for a reason. It should have gone to the vice presidency. But my wife is right. She tells me I talk too much. But <laughs> the time. Oh, yeah, no. it is about all the time we have. I want to like to thank uh, Lee and Mike for being here tonight. You know, if you would like for more information on uh, about the show, about our panelists, and about information we've talked here, you can go to our website, libertariancounterpoint.com. Um, if you're catching us on YouTube, Please hit the like and subscribe button so we can so you can see us when we go out there, and you can also start looking for us on your favorite social media programs. Uh huh. And 